The Trump-Bolsonaro effect hits Brazil, a country that has its own issues with misinformation. Alexander Lukashenko apes his ally. Belarus's crackdown on journalism is Putin-esque. And TikTok and the Mafia, elements of the Italian underworld, are surfacing online. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the coverage and analyze how news gets reported. It was an insurrection that was months, even years, in the making. Last Sunday's invasion of Brazil's democratic institutions in its capital, Brasilia, coming two years and two days after the January 6th assault on the U.S. Capitol in Washington, it looked like a carbon copy. Rioters storming the seat of government, acting in the name of former presidents, out to overturn elections they had lost. Like MAGA Americans, many of Jair Bolsonaro's supporters have been radicalized online. They circulate their conspiracy theories on platforms that are mostly unregulated, encrypted messaging apps like Telegram and WhatsApp. Brazilian analysts say everyone should have seen this coming. All the signs were there and that the future of Brazilian democracy still hangs in the balance. What happened in Brasilia on January 8th proved that a playbook written in Washington two years ago on a January 6th can translate and travel. Just change Trump to Bolsonaro, stop the steal to a hashtag like Festa de Selma, and then let disinformation do its thing. When January 6th happened, in those groups of WhatsApp and Telegram that support Bolsonaro, they were all looking at what was happening in the U.S. and saying, this is what should happen in Brazil. The elections there were fraudulent. It was stolen the same way that the elections in Brazil is going to be stolen. So this has been months and months of priming his supporters in this kind of way. If I don't have 60% of the votes, something abnormal happened on the TSE. And that idea has kind of begun to spread and repeated um, across all social media platforms. Negativo. Nós não acreditamos nessa, 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 nessas eleições. Foram fraudadas. Staging that sort of big lie rhetoric and also um, pitting his supporters against democratic institutions. Uh, it seems like a copied version of the Capitol riots. And uh, it goes a long way into explaining the relationship between Bolsonarism and Trumpism. The timeline looks like this. Jair Bolsonaro left Brazil on December 30th, two months after losing a close election in late October. He landed in Florida two days before the new president, Lula da Silva, was sworn into office. And 10 days before the riot. Bolsonaro left millions of loyalists behind, including, apparently, the official in charge of security in the capital, who then reportedly joined his former boss in Florida and watched the story unfold from there. Anderson Torres, who is the, the, the chief responsible for security in Brasilia, he saw about 85 buses coming into the city. And guess what he does? He goes to Orlando to hang out with Bolsonaro and next thing we know, we see this insurgency happening. It's like, why would he flee the Brasilia? It doesn't take a genius to understand how things were plotted. One of the differences between Trump and Bolsonaro is that Bolsonaro is much more cowardly. He left Brazil, whereas Trump stayed in the U.S. and keeps inciting his base on Twitter, etc. Bolsonaro's base asked him for guidance, and he didn't want to give it probably because he knew the plan that was in progress and that he could be blamed for it. During his successful election campaign in 2018, Jair Bolsonaro's strategy was to circumvent mainstream media outlets, trash their journalists, and go all in online. By 2022, Telegram and WhatsApp were his primary platforms, particularly Telegram a messaging app notorious for its lack of content moderation. Misinformation thrives there, unchallenged. On other platforms, such as Facebook and Twitter, Bolsonaro's supporters rely on certain code words. One example, just days before the riot, messages appeared online about a festa de selva in Brasilia. That translates to a jungle party. It's also military slang for a war. 
That term would have attracted attention from anyone policing content, so Selva was altered to Selma. Bolsonaro's supporters, reading between the lines, figured it out. Coded hashtags like Festa de Selma do most of their damage on apps like Telegram and WhatsApp. Because these are encrypted messaging apps, it makes much harder for anyone to monitor how information is spread, who is spreading it. Telegram has this sort of very radical stance uh, defending freedom of information. They do very little or nothing to prevent misinformation from being spread and we have very active far-right groups with sometimes millions of members and that allows this content to spread very quickly. Telegram has been a platform that Bolsonaro and his sons have been pushing and promoting for a long time. Uh, it kind of started when um, the more traditional social media platforms started to take a tougher line on Bolsonaro's rhetoric, uh, especially his uh, misinformation about uh, COVID-19 vaccines and so forth. And there was a potential risk that he may be banned from those platforms. So that was the beginning of the kind of migration towards Telegram, which his right-wing followers uh, deemed a safer space to entertain their version of free speech. Prior to the October election, Brazil's Supreme Court granted the electoral authorities the right to unilaterally order tech companies to take down false information and to do it within two hours. As for the mainstream media, for decades, conservative presidential candidates like Bolsonaro could rely on the support of Globo, Latin America's biggest broadcaster and media player. Globo even backed the military dictatorship that ruled Brazil for two decades until the mid-1980s. But Bolsonaro's targeting of conventional news outlets has changed all that. Globo and newspapers owned by the same parent company have fought back. They have been critical of him and his election-denying acolytes. Bolsonaro still has Recorj TV, a channel popular with evangelicals, in his corner. Nós cremos que ele foi um escolhido de Deus para fazer o país mudar. And the relatively new kid on the block is a channel called Jovem Pan, the closest thing Brazil has to a Fox News. Hoje é o único líder político que defende a liberdade. Então a Jovem Pan. So, Jovem Pan emerges during the Bolsonaro government. For decades, it was a small radio station. But then, Bolsonaro's government gives them the go-ahead to become a cable channel. And then, an acquaintance of Bolsonaro's takes up this opportunity and implements a kind of Fox News in Brazil that had never existed before. That is to say, a cable channel openly supporting Bolsonaro, which spreads conspiracy theories, disinformation narratives, and is very aggressive and violent. During the January 8th riots in Brasilia, some uh, Jovem Pan pundits were actually trying to find reasons of why people were committing crimes against uh, democracy, normalizing them. Tudo isso que nós estamos assistindo parte disso, de quem tornou a, a eleição brasileira inconfiável. They have overrepresented these uh, far-right uh, pundits that defend the big lie narrative that Bolsonaro has tried to put forward. On January the 9th, federal prosecutors in Brazil have asked for a civil investigation into Jovem Pan's role in inciting anti-democratic and violent acts against uh, the Brazilian state. YouTube has acted against Jovem Pan as well demonetizing its content, denying it a vital source of online revenue. But it is outside of the mainstream where the real work must be done. That's where most of the misinformation lives. And while Jair Bolsonaro looks done and dusted politically, the threat to democracy in Latin America's biggest country remains. There is not such a thing as a silver bullet to fight misinformation and hate. It's a multifaceted problem that requires a collective and multifaceted solution. So we all should act, the courts, 
the government, the platforms, regulation, civil society, NGOs. We should all act together so finally we can put an end to this nonsense. Bolsonaroismo will definitely live on after Bolsonaro. He's been disgraced by what's happened um, on Sunday. His chances of being re-elected are a lot slimmer now, but the movement that he's created, a more polarised country, um, this idea of championing traditional values, gun rights, these ideas resonated with a lot of Brazilians. I think will continue afterwards, online and offline, because what there is now is a very divided country, which will swing right or left. In Belarus this week, journalists from what was once the country's top independent news outlet went on trial. It is the latest in a wave of prosecutions against reporters by the government of Alexander Lukashenko. Minakshi Ravi is here with the details. Most of the news coming out of Belarus over the past year has focused on President Lukashenko's support for his ally and neighbor Vladimir Putin over the war against Ukraine. <laughs> But at home, Lukashenko is still dealing with the aftermath of nationwide protests back in 2020 that threatened his rule. Activists were locked up en masse, and the authorities have come down hard on journalists. This past Monday, five reporters from the news website tut.by went on trial. It was the country's most popular online media outlet until the authorities banned it in 2021. Three of the accused have already fled the country, but Tut.by's former editor-in-chief, Marina Zalatava, and Director General Lyudmila Chekina are in the dock in Minsk. The charges range from dodging taxes to inciting hatred and, quote, hurting national security. And if convicted, the journalists face up to 12 years in prison. Tut.by was one of the few outlets that provided extensive coverage of the 2020 demonstrations, which were the largest in Belarus's history. They started after Lukashenko won a sixth presidential term in an election that most analysts say was clearly rigged. In a statement issued on the eve of the trial, Zerkalo, a new outlet founded by the former Tut.by journalists, said the case was fabricated and that, quote, Belarus is rushing forward on a path to an alternative reality where real news is considered evil. Thanks, Mina. To Italy now, where the digital revolution has penetrated the depths of the underworld. Some mafia groups, traditionally known for secrecy, keeping a low profile, are now operating in plain sight on TikTok. The platform has become the go-to form of communication for younger generations of different Italian mafia groups, from the Indragata in Calabria to the Camorra in Naples. They might be on TikTok to recruit new members, or they're just putting a more polished brand out there, reminding citizens of their ever-presence. With specific hashtags and emojis, it is a subtle yet effective way to exercise soft power. Among the Italian TikTokers following those accounts, the country's anti-mafia directorate, investigators in search of evidence. The Listening Post's Flo Phillips now from Rome on the mafia's new online stomping ground. For justice, we must go to Don Corleone. It's August 1972, and the first installment of Francis Ford Coppola's Godfather trilogy is released in the United States. I'm gonna make him an offer he can refuse. It's the cult movie that spearheaded an entire gangster genre, bringing the infamous Italian mafia, albeit a romanticized representation of it, to the big screen. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Since then, the Mafia, its chapters and characters, have been depicted in hundreds of movies and TV series. From Goodfellas to Gamora. But today, as The Godfather's celebrating its 50th anniversary, there's a new, more honest portrayal of the Mafia on a much smaller screen with a different director. Today, with the advent of TikTok and social media, the Mafia can tell its own story, adapting those filmic representations to better reflect their own lifestyles. They show us where they live, how they live, 
the real conditions of their world. TikTok plays an important role because by its very nature, it's a media platform that creates protagonists. Essentially, it is governed by the principle brand yourself. And that branding, or rebranding, is key to the Mafia's identity. Honed over decades, brand Mafia has its roots in the 19th century Sicilian countryside, an armed wing of feudal nobility with the sole purpose of quashing claims from aggrieved peasants. Since then, the Sicilian Mafia, also known as Cosa Nostra, together with the Calabrian Andrangheta, the Neapolitan Camorra and the Puglian Sacra Corona Unita has become entrenched in Italy's political and cultural consciousness. While each branch is unique, when it comes to branding themselves on TikTok, this new propaganda push has one main message, money. What we see in these videos is wealth. For example, we find videos of someone like Christian Esposito, the son of a Camorra boss from Naples' west side. We see him with his friends opening champagne bottles and dancing. In another video, we see the son of an imprisoned Camorra boss, Decenzo Marino. He's also showing off his wealth. He appears very well dressed, elegant, but viewers know this isn't some Burberry model. He's the boss's son, or is there sometimes referred to a baby boss, so they know that the Marino clan is still out there and has money. Over the past few decades, arrests of some big mafia names have made headlines in Italy and beyond. But the TikTok videos tell a different story. They edit out the crimes committed, the violence of the underworld. Instead, baby bosses brag about their latest tattoo, fancy watch, expensive car, all set to a local beat. It's the recurring use of symbols and hashtags that give away an affiliation with organized crime. You find emojis that express feelings. The lion is used to suggest strength and power. The exploding bomb can represent military might, but also a threat. Then there are chains that relate to the fact that many of the mafia consider themselves to be imprisoned, living under a kind of house arrest. Or the syringe, with a single drop of blood, reinterpreted by the mafia, to symbolize a blood pact, brotherhood. It's like a virtual staking out of their territory. This somewhat contrasts the way in which the organization used to live. Until a few years ago, the Ndrangheta, for example, compared to the Camorra, always kept a low profile. It was absolutely forbidden to exhibit wealth. Bosses on the run spend years and years of their lives in conditions of extreme discomfort, living in caves, in tunnels. This is no longer considered an acceptable way of life. Deliberately clandestine to brazenly overt, the Mafia's presence on TikTok is a stark departure from its original media modus operandi. And it's representative of a wider social evolution for one of the most powerful criminal networks in the world, a shift from hard to soft power. Violence was always part of the Mafia narrative. Murder, extortion, various forms of petty crime. It was the media and the message. Today, 200 years on, the modern-day equivalent of this tradition is on social media, the Mafia responding to the impact of the digital world. These videos are about parading their wealth, and not just in front of their own local community, but also in front of the authorities. These videos show both their financial as well as their military power, but in less risky ways. So before, a clan that was under attack from another Camorra clan might show its strength with so-called stese, drive-by shooting, but these acts of violence brought with them the police. Now, you might see a drive through the neighborhood in a Ferrari, recorded on TikTok, so that people understand the clan is still strong, the clan is still in charge. The Ndrangheta branch wants to be seen as entrepreneurs right now. They're looking for social consensus. That means presenting yourself with a, quote, clean face. So the message on TikTok is, we're good people, like everyone else. See for yourself if what we're saying is true. And this is where the pitfall lies. 
They present themselves as problem-solving organizations. Organizzazioni problem solving. As the coordinator of Milan's anti-mafia directorate, or DDA, Alessandra Dolci knows how dangerous this whitewashing of the mafia is. She's been fighting the Andrangheta's networks in the north of Italy for more than 30 years now. The DDA is part of the National Anti-Mafia and Counter-Terrorism Directorate, a key institution based here in Rome. It was established in 1991 as a counterweight to the extraordinary power that the Mafia wielded back then and still does today. As times change and organised crime embraces the digital world, the DDA is changing too, often utilising some of the same tools like TikTok for its investigations and clues can be found in the smallest details, if you know where to look. Through TikTok imagery, we try to decode the messages the Andrangheta exchange. We focus on trying to work out the relationships between the subjects. For example, it's now become a common thing to upload pictures of weddings, baptisms, birthday parties, important public events in which members of the Andrangheta clans meet. So, not being invited to an Andrangheta wedding means a member has been cast aside, maybe even received a death threat. This happened in an investigation a few years ago. TikTok is important for us because it shows the new direction the Mafia is taking. To lead good investigations, you must first understand the Mafia's mentality and its strategies. The Mafia's media strategy, led by a new digitally savvy generation, seems to be all about maintaining power through social media. A more subtle way of reaffirming their presence, polishing their brand, growing their footprint. And TikTok is the perfect place for this strategy to spread because ultimately, criminal organizations and social media have a key thing in common, a network. Social media replicates real world social networks. Mafias are a social network, so they have an innate understanding of how networks are actually built. The virtual world is the real world. There is no difference in this case. TikTok is such a direct medium, it shows what's actually happening. Whatever goes down on the streets, if you're there, you will see it happen. If you're not, you can check it out later on TikTok. It's one and the same thing. We cannot think of it in terms of two separate worlds. Today, the Mafia oscillates between the real and the virtual, bringing them together in a new space, a new sphere. It's the key to the Mafia's ability to adapt. And finally, the release of a memoir by Britain's Prince Harry earlier this week is the latest chapter in his PR offensive. Harry's campaign started in 2021 on Oprah Winfrey's couch. It has also resulted in a six-part, $100 million documentary on Netflix. Parts of the book were leaked last week, and British royal watchers, who are a media industry unto themselves, have shifted into meltdown mode while exposing some odd priorities of their own. Harry's remorseless claim that when with the British military in Afghanistan, he killed 25 members of the Taliban in a war that cost a quarter of a million people their lives? That's not what got the pundits going. The prince's decision to talk trash about members of the royal household, though, well, that's just uncivilized. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. You're the bully. You're the one trashing your family in public, not the family that stayed silent throughout this onslaught. And the real victims of this are firstly William and Kate, who are now getting a whole load of nonsense in the press that they know full well William can't answer back to. That's not the boy that I knew. The princess would be appalled. I hate Harry. But for what he's doing to the UK, he's not just Absolutely. embarrassing the royal family and himself, he's embarrassing the UK. It's a family dispute. They, they need to sort it out amongst themselves. I mean, no, the media shouldn't ignore it because then we wouldn't all be here. You know, if he's in a good place, as yeah. he says, and as Omid Scobie says, this, he feels like he's told his story and he can now move on. Well, it would be a, a huge relief, wouldn't it, if that was it, and if that was the last we had to talk about this damn story.